like when you listen to the radio, like certain stations, they had a guy, I think he was a famous um, radio broadcaster, and he had a little like five minute show that would come on called The Rest of the Story. Has anybody ever heard it? Yeah, I'll be hearing, I, I know. Um, but that was the name of his little show, and what, what he would, he would, before the commercial would come on, he would say, um, give you a little hint about what he was about to share, and then he would say, come back after the announcements, and you'll get the rest of the story, and he would t talk about famous things, things that you were familiar with, but you may not have been totally familiar with. And what I found is as I was preparing for this quote unquote Palm Sunday message, that's what it's traditionally called because religion has changed it, is no reference to a Palm Sunday in the scripture, but they took the day that Jesus triumphantly came into Jerusalem and they attached the name to it. And, and I, I'm not mad at them for that, it's, it's just knowledge and the day that Jesus Christ entered into Jerusalem where he was in, they, they, they acknowledged him as the king of kings and lords of lords. And at the same time, it was less than three days later when they were cr screaming crucify him, the same people that wanted him to come in and be their king wanted him to lay down his life, did not understand the significance of the event. Even today, I find it interesting that we, when we talk about Palm Sunday, we never talk about the rest of the story. There's more to the story. And I want today to emphasize more of the rest of the story to give us an idea of what Jesus' purposes and intent was when he entered into Jerusalem. The acknowledging of him riding in on a coat is very important. But there is more to the story. And Sometimes when we find out what the rest of the story is, it puts in perspective what God's intentions were as he was structuring our salvation. Everything God, Jesus Christ did in his three and a half years of ministry was to set up for what we are living in now. We are living in the dispensation of grace. We are living in the dispensation where we can rely on three words that Jesus himself said, it is finished. We can now stand on his word that it says he presented his, his blood unblemished, unmarred on the mercy seat and God accepted it. Because God accepted it, we now can go boldly before the throne of grace. We no longer have to have the blood of goats and rams and doves. or, or It's the shed blood of Jesus that was the one and only sacrifice that was holy and acceptable to God so that we now are free. Because he whom the is free indeed. So as we begin to look, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 21. The book of gospel according to Matthew, the tax collector, the sinner. He was a slick one. Matthew was something else. See, sometimes when you try to compare yourself, when you think about, a lot of them decide Matthew was a rascal. Matthew owned like 
the pawn shop from hell. Tax collectors ta collected taxes on behalf of Rome, but because of the authority that they had, they abused their power. They were like the IRS on steroids. Most of your tax collectors were considered collaborators. They had the back. They were, they were children of Israel. They were Jews. But they had the backing of, you know, if you did not obey what they said, then he could whistle and a hundred Roman soldiers would show up at your door. So you paid not only taxes to Rome, but you paid protection money. It was a protection racket. It was a racket. And it was, Matthew was one of those tax collectors, him, and it was a few more. Some of y'all know about the one that climbed up in the tree. Zacchaeus, because he was short, he climbed up in the tree. And Jesus saw him say, I'm eating at your house today. And they couldn't believe that he was going to eat with tax collectors and sinners, prostitutes coming in and out the house. So how could he be a prophet? Doesn't he know what kind of woman that is? This was all at the, you know, so he ate at Matthew's house the same way. They, they had a lot to say. They didn't like, they didn't like the prophet cord, um, fellowshipping with sinners. You know, even today, they, 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 um, they don't want the pastor to deal with the sinner. Why is he, why is he down there on that corner talking to them? It'll get on the news, past the scene on drug corner. When pastor down there trying to help a drug dealer get saved. Same thing was going on back then. So Matthew was a rascal, but he captured something. He became a disciple, a very faithful disciple, one that recorded the gospel of Matthew and has given us a, a, a picture of the life of Jesus Christ. So in Matthew 21... It says, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught to you unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a coat the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the coat and put, them, put on them their clothes and they set him, Jesus, thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Now everybody that has been around church any amount of time from a child knows about Palm Sunday. And they know that the predominant tree that would have grown in that arid 
climate was a palm tree, yet fig trees, yet palm trees. And they know that when they would pull down and they would use the palm trees, straw, if you've seen a palm branch, it's, it's like the same straw that they make baskets out of. They weave them together and make baskets. And, and for years and years, every Palm Sunday, I would go to church and they would give, they would hand out palms, palm branches, just a little, little, little strip from, from a leaf. And they would, as you came in, you'd get a palm branch. And then some churches got creative and they would fold the branch up and some would fold it into the shape of a cross. <laughs> some would fold it into a, like an angel. They, I mean, they would, I've seen very create, get it very creative with the palm branch. So that this became a very religious holiday and, and, you know, we acknowledge it and there's certain foods that get cooked today and on and on to acknowledge Palm Sunday. It acknowledges the day when Jesus Christ rolled in Jerusalem triumphantly and he was acknowledged. If you studied the word, he pretty much avoided Jerusalem for the most part. He knew what his destiny would be in Jerusalem. In fact, the last time he had come to Jerusalem, they had attempted to stone him. And he left. I mean, he went right through the midst of them and left. And in, as he was passing through them, he healed a blind man, if anybody knows that story in the Gospel of John. So he had avoided Jerusalem for a long time. Then one day as they were traveling, him and his disciples together, he turned and said to them, I have to go to Jerusalem. And his disciples, he said, in fact, he didn't just say, I have to go to Jerusalem. He said, I have to go to Jerusalem because the chief priests are going to arrest me. They're going to beat me. They're going to put a crown of thorns on me. They're going to hang me from a tree. But don't worry, because in three days, I'm going to get up of my own accord, and I am going to have victory over death. And everybody that knows, has, knows a little bit of Bible says, Peter turned around and rebuked him and said, not so. And he said to Peter, the rock, the one whom he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He turned to Peter and looked Peter in the face and said, get behind me, Satan. Because thou savorest the things of the world and not the things of God. So here he is. He's, he has now made a decision. So the disciples Okay, I guess we go into Jerusalem. So they are now going into Jerusalem. He has given them instructions to keep, if you follow the life of Jesus, he's fulfilled prophecy after prophecy. His birth was a fulfillment of prophecy. His life is a fulfillment of prophecy. God gave us a hint, an insight into what he was going to do with his son, with his crucified Savior. So he gets to Jerusalem, he goes through the pomp and circumstance, the people acknowledge him, and now we can get the rest of the story. Because after they question who he was, I believe the Bible now will say something to the order of, then he went into the temple. I don't know, is that what say something like that in your Bible, the next verse? Then Jesus did what? He went into the temple. So what I began to see, well, okay, there's more to the story than everybody crying out Hosanna because he went into the temple and I believe his intent was to go in the temple to pray. Because he will acknowledge in another statement that what the temple was there for. But when he got into the temple, he didn't like what he saw. He saw 
mess in the temple. He saw poo-poo in the temple. Oh, I'm telling you. If you got doves in a cage in the temple to sell, they don't have, huh? They had all kind of stuff in there. And don't none of that stuff have no, thank you, they're not housebroken. So he comes in the temple and he sees, now animals are supposed to come to the temple to be sacrificed that they might shed blood for an atonement. But they in there selling them. And not only were they selling animals, but they were selling doves, which the dove has always throughout Scripture represented the presence of the Holy Spirit. If everybody know the book of Acts when, when they were ministering and this man came up behind Peter and them and said, hey, can I buy this power that you have? And he said, I rebuke you, Simon, because you cannot buy the anointing. The anointing cannot be purchased nor sold. The anointing is the gift from God, and it's by faith received. So he is coming to the temple, and he sees a mess. And the sweet, lovable Jesus that has healed folk all over, 38 years a man gets up off his, off his bed. Blind men, lepers healed. This sweet, lovable Jesus that they brought the, the woman in adultery to him, and he said, he that is among you without sin, let him cast the first stone. Let him, and he said, go and sin no more. The one that, that went into the, 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 the tax collector's home and the woman, the the, the kind of woman that if he only knew what kind of woman she was, he wouldn't let her touch him. And he said this, he said, because of what she has done, because she has anointed my feet for my burial and she has anointed my feet with her tears, everywhere that this gospel is preached, you are going to mention her. This same Jesus goes into the temple and goes off. He went off. He went straight thug. <laughs> the people that was watching were like, that the prophet? That we was just shouting how Hosanna because he came in. They say he pulled a strap out and got the beating folks and pow, pow, and kicking folks and turning over the tables. He went off. Why would he go off like that? Jesus. Went off. I, I, when, I, when I studied Jesus, what I noticed about him, I want you to understand the, the dichotomy here, the, the, the transition, because you got to know how Jesus was before this. Nothing ever shook him. He never showed any kind of emotional outburst. The Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers constantly would try to trick him and ask him questions, try to catch him in his own words. They would try to, they, and, and, and he was always cool as a cucumber. They would twist him up. What if, what if a man, he had seven brothers, they, all these long stories and try to trip him up. And he would always say something that would blow their minds to the point that they said, well, nobody ever asked him any more questions. <laughs> the Bible, Bible says that after that, mm -mm. He, was, he never got upset about it. He never went off. Now, he preached on them. He called them vipers, asps. He said, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. In other words, you're like graves with painted white, but ain't nothing on the inside but dead man's bone. He preached on them, but he never lost his cool. 
till Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, he wasn't that cool. He went off. I got to, y'all have to imagine how he went off. I don't even sometimes think the Bible even helps us to really understand how bad he went off. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. He overturned the table. So you come in, and I mean, he just took the table and flipped it like that. And the seats, in other words, which you sitting in it. Oh, Jesus went off. And said unto them, what got him so upset? What would make Jesus Christ, the most anointed man ever to live, go off? Do not come and treat the Father's house the way you're treating it. said, my house, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. But after he got the house in order, talking to Dominion this morning. When he got the money changers out, when he got the thieves out, when he got the crooks out, when he got the sinners out, I'm not talking about, I'm not expecting nobody to be perfect. It's an attitude. When he got the temple right, the rest of the story. See, the story keeps adding on. What happened next? I believe the Bible says the blind and the lame then showed up and he healed them. So let's see the picture. Jesus Christ rolls in triumphantly into your life. I'm going to deal with you as an individual. Jesus Christ, you have seen him. He's riding in on the coat. And you now see him. He's been revealed to you. And you then cry out, Hosanna. Whoever cries upon the name of the Lord shall be. So now you have seen him, you acknowledge him, and now you cry out, save me, Lord. Hallelujah, I believe in you. You are my savior. You are my king. You're my Lord. And he receives you with open arms. But the first thing he does after he, re after he receives you, because you have now received him as your Lord, he's coming to your temple. Oh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's glad that you now saved. He's glad that you now filled with the Holy Ghost. He's happy that you're no longer going to hell. He's happy that you have eternal life. But now he got to deal with the temple. So now he's going to come into your temple and he's going to turn some stuff over. Upside down. down. He's going to flip you out the chair. Because he's got to get you ready for the blind and the lame. Because the blind and the lame can't find the temple. The blind can't find it and the lame can't get there. So your temple got to be right so that you can reach them.
the rest of the story. He said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer. In the, in, where it is written in the Old Testament, he says, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. But you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus, after your salvation experience, he's going to love on you. He's coming in as your Lord and Savior. But he is going to, through the power of the Holy Ghost, clean up your temple. And I found out something for myself. And I'm going to help somebody that may be in this situation. You can either let him clean it up or he'll clean it up without you. You can, you know how they say, we can do this one or two ways. The easy way with your cooperation or the hard way. But now that you have called on my name, I'm going to clean the temple. Not about you. It's not about you. Sometimes we get so hung up thinking that it's all about us. No. No. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Where's the temple? Where, uh, okay. We're the temple. So what we saw in the natural was a press precursor because it always comes in the natural first, followed by that which is spiritual. So in the natural, he cleaned the temple after they acknowledged him as Lord so that the line, blind and lame could find a place to get healed. Jesus wants to use you, dominion, to see folks healed. There's blind, and it's not always natural. There are more spiritually blind people on this planet than there are naturally blind people on this planet. The Bible in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 clearly states that the enemy has blinded the minds of them that don't believe. So they can't see the temple. They are wandering around thinking everything is okay but they don't realize how lost they are. And Jesus has to get the temple right so that we can reach those lost souls. Help him get your temple right. Help him make a place for the blind and the lame to come to find shelter to find healing, to find anointing, to find encouragement. That's what it's about for you. If you will allow him to clean up your temple, then there's a place for the blind and the lame. Give God a hand cap of praise. Hallelujah. 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 You know, uh, when you come to church to hear the word, do you present yourself?